It's an awesome privilege to get together to fellowship with you guys. I don't know how you guys are feeling, but I have a lot of fun. No, it's genuine. This is not for me, This is family, man. This, can you talk to me on a week under your foot? But we have a lot of fun. We had the privilege of ministering in the Umchesi district in Kaiserin. That's between Vienen and uh, Greytown. We had um, many nationals or many get-togethers or regional meetings, for want of a better word, with our CMA and Bikers Church family down there. We had an opportunity to minister and share the word over Resurrection Weekend. What a privilege it was to be able to minister at night under the stars. And let me tell you how that came about. They were expecting a certain amount of people, and they made provision for that amount of people at the venue uh, in Babala Game Lodge. Lots of biking. Lots and lots of biking. It's like incredible. But uh, the amount of people that turned up were just too much. So that's a good problem to have. So we had to have open air meetings. And it was absolutely beautiful being able to worship the Lord under the stars like that. It was absolutely incredible. So we really had a wonderful resurrection weekend. And I trust that you guys enjoyed your time here as well. Thank you once again to, to Jan and Anna Marie for coming just to stand in a gap and minister to you guys at that time. I'm excited to introduce a new sermon series this week called You Are Worth It. So if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 5 verse 6 to 8. Romans chapter 5 verse 6 to 8. Have you noticed the new posters? I don't know if Brandon's here or watching online, but thank you sir for your very quick, hard work. When you press your button, you make it happen. And thanks to Renee for just affording him that opportunity to do it for us. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 to 8. We're going to read this and then pray as we unpack this message this week. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person. Though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed His great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. What a precious passage of Scripture, Lord God, that we can meditate on. That You died for us at just the right time. Lord, when we are honest with ourselves and see ourselves apart from the blood of Jesus, we're worthless, Lord. But cleansed by the blood of Jesus, made whole and new, we are worth it to you. We thank you for this selfless sacrifice so that we can experience life and life in abundance because of, of what you have done, Lord Jesus. And Father, we acknowledge our dependency upon you this morning. Myself especially, Lord, i got nothing to say to anybody that can change anybody's life. But one word from you, Lord, can change us forever. Holy Spirit, would you minister the life and the power and the grace and the redemptive message of the gospel into all of our hearts as we meditate on your word this morning. Thank you that you minister to every person listening, watching online and in both buildings here, Lord that they have a real encounter with the living God. And we thank you for that in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Imagine God being an investor that does a survey and determines where's the best place to invest his assets. Imagine him being an investor and deciding to invest his most valuable asset. The thing which is most precious to God. I can tell you now, it's not a motorbike. It's not his favorite cloud because God rides the clouds and the winds. It's not something that God's most valued, prized possession, if I may use that word this morning in this context. Imagine he's looking to invest his most prized possession, his son, Jesus Christ. And out of all creation... Out of everything that He's made, and He's made so much more than we know, our universe is expanding all the time and growing, because when God said, let there be, guess what? His Word is still traveling, and it's creating. They've worked out that the universe is expanding. 
How do they do that? I don't know. That's way above my pay grade. Slim means of it. I that. But out of everywhere that he can possibly invest, he chooses to invest Jesus in an offshore venture. Out of the realms of the heavenlies, where there's perfection and glory and holiness and majesty, he chooses to invest his most prized possession in an offshore adventure called earth. And he decides, this is where I'm going to invest my best. I'm not an investment or venture capitalist, but I probably wouldn't invest in this little blue marble. If I look at our track record and what we're busy doing, I probably would have chosen some better place to invest my best asset. God chose to invest Jesus Christ in this offshore adventure called earth. Let's take it a little bit further. Let's say God wants to invest even more. He's even more adventurous. And he's even more risky, so to speak. And he decides to invest his most valuable asset, Jesus, into your life. Now, I know you guys have sterling track records. But if I look at my life, there's no ways I would invest in me. If I was a racehorse, I'm most certainly not a racehorse. I would certainly not back me. I wouldn't back me. I'm unpredictable. I'm unreliable. I'm self-righteous. I think of the three most important people to me first. Me, myself, and I. And if there's anything left, done, don't get on honor. I wouldn't invest in me. But my brother, my sister, the good news is that God sees you and you are worth it. To Him, you are worth it. Imagine sacrificing your child for somebody that might say, Nah, not for me. I'm not into this church stuff. I'm not into this Jesus thing. I'm not into religion. Imagine running that risk. Wie van jylle so dit gedoen het? Hmm? But to God, we worth it. What is it in human beings that have the... Sometimes I don't think it's a privilege. My men say, ons sal nie die liefde kan verstaan sonder hierdie nie. But what is it about people that have their own free will that God sees it fit to invest Jesus in us? People that may never choose him at all. God must know something about us that we don't know about ourselves yet. He chooses to invest in us because you are worth it. God is willing to work with anybody that's willing to work with him because he knows he can do the impossible. Think about it. He's willing to work with anybody who's willing to work with him because he knows he can do the impossible. He knows he can take cracked pots like us and do the impossible through us. Think about that. He knows it. He knows it because he made us. He created us. He thought of us. And in one day on your birthday, he decided this is a day I'm going to release you into the world. He's willing to work with anybody who's willing to work with him Because he knows he can do the impossible. If I think about the concept of tearing the devil's kingdom down and building the kingdom of God, I think it's impossible, Lord. Who do knows that? Lord, do you know that it's 2021? Do you know what's actually going on here? Do you know how it's becoming increasingly popular to be ungodly and increasingly unpopular to be godly? Does God, do you know that actually? Do you know that it's not cool to love Jesus. That it's not hip to live for Jesus. Do you know that, God? Do you know? And we've got, to, we've got to face all of this. But God says in Matthew 19 and verse 26, Jesus is for man. This is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Somehow, God sees the supernatural possibility that His kingdom can still be built on the hearts of people. Because the kingdom of God is built on the condition of the human heart. Who 
weet nie wat die rechte woorde is nie, vir die dinge van die Heere, vir die koninkrijk van God, how receptive are we to that? And God sees that He can work through people and achieve the impossible for anybody that's willing to work with the Lord. How many of you are willing to work, work with the Lord this morning? And say, Lord, I believe you for the impossible, Lord. I don't understand it. See, the scripture says, by faith we believe. By faith. So faith comes and then we get to see what God does. By faith we know that all things were made. It doesn't start off by saying we know because we know things and then there's faith. That's how the kingdom of God works. And may God enable us to see things the way He does. So if God sees that He can achieve the impossible through us, I want to put it in other words this morning and say, don't let your limitations keep you from pursuing God's purpose for your life. Can we just get that timer on at the back there, please, gents? Don't let your limitations keep you from pursuing God's purpose for your life. Waar jy jou self oortuig, ek kan nie. Ek het hoeveel keer probeer, Mozzie, I still can't get it right. Others can, but I've tried, Mozzie, and I just can't. Or you think about past mistakes and you say, I've tried it once. I know what it's like for me when I fall. I, I like trying things that's like next to the impossible on my dirt bike. And I, I try and I fail and I fall. I get bruises and my bike gets scratched and I get up again. And every time I get on again, I can't help but think of what happened to Atmos Lickett. But if I don't get on and do it again, I'll never get over that obstacle. I've got to do it again and again. And what I have to do is I have to take a deep breath. And sometimes a deep breath breath. Because <sighs> I'm at the age where my mind makes promises that my body can't keep. <laughs> and I have to visualize myself getting up there. I've got to visualize it. That's why God has given us an imagination. Because if you can't picture it in your imagination, you're not going to be able to achieve it. It's called vision. It's called vision. And when you can visualize it, you see, okay, I can do this. So, moet jou nie blind staar aan jou mislukkings van die verlede and your past mistakes. Don't let the devil continuously accuse you of something over and over that Jesus Christ has forgiven you of long time ago. The scripture teaches that God is faithful and just, that if we confess our sins to Him, He'll forgive us of all our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 and verse 9 says that. So, don't let your limitations keep you from stepping into the destiny and the plan that God has for you. You are not defined by your past mistakes. You are not defined by what people speak over you. How should we relate to each other? And this is challenging. We should relate and interact to each other, not by, let's look in leadership context, for example. If you, if you get together a leadership team, you have certain expectations from leaders. That's just how life works. And then they let you down big time. And then they extend the right hand of fellowship and give you a hug, but all they're doing is just looking for a place in your back to stick the knife in. And you feel disappointed and hurt. Ach, shame. Sies toch. Look what they've done to Jesus. Okay? And then we start relating to people based on their past mistakes. It's a difficult one, isn't it? How should we be relating to each other? We should be relating to each other according to the prophetic word of God spoken over your life. Nobody's excited about that. Ladies and gentlemen, that changes everything. Because if I re relate to you about what God says to you, it changes everything. If I relate to you according to the way that I think you've disappointed me, oh, then it's the kingdom according to Mozzie. And it shouldn't be like that. And that's how it is with God. Don't let your limitations and your past mistakes keep you from God's destiny for your life. Because to God, you are worth it. He sees something in you that you yourself haven't perhaps seen. Now sometimes we see too much of ourselves. Kiss me quick before I kiss myself. <laughs> sometimes we just love ourselves too much. Now, here's where you get the godly balance, ladies and gentlemen, it's like this. And I, 
no matter how many times I've said this, it never loses its punch and its power and its truth because it's profound. Don't think less of yourself. Think of yourself less. Can you the see? see? Don't think less of yourself. Think of yourself less. Because somehow, to God, you were worth it. Him taking His most prized possession and investing in you. And what's profound about that scripture that we opened up with, it says, you, you see, Jesus didn't die after I said, yes, Lord, here I am, use me. The scripture says that Jesus died at just the right time while we were still sinners, while we were still warring against God, while we were still enemies of the throne of God. He says, I'm going to do it. I'm going to lay down my life because they're worth it. And I think one of the secrets of that is that why did God choose to make us in His image? I mean, think of being able to do absolutely anything you want with whatever you got, with whenever you want. And, and He makes us in His image. Like, really? Couldn't He come up with better ideas? No. He chose us. But isn't it? I mean, He could have chosen anything. I think the secret why He sees us as worth it is He made us in His image because He knows. He knows. You see, God sees the end from the beginning. Imagine this. Imagine when all is said and done, the fat lady and her sister, they've all sang, the chips are down, and imagine God seeing us reigning and ruling with Him one day. If sin, death, and the grave is defeated, have you ever wondered, what is it that we're going to rule over? What is it that we're going to reign over? If sin, death, and the grave is defeated, and all the devil and his cronies are defeated once and all, grootste pak slaag gekry van a jylle lewe, it's done what, do, what is there to rule and reign over? I don't know. But God says we're going to reign with Him. We're going to reign over something. We're going to rule over something. Imagine God giving us the ability to say, Light be. Whew. Ladies and gentlemen, imagine us standing side by side with the Trinity. And God says, Okay, you check, that's how I spoke that universe into existence. That's how I spoke that galaxy into existence. That's how I created that creature, that beautiful flower, that microscopic organism. Now he says, okay, son, my daughter, you go for it. You have a chance now. You create something. Are you getting this, folks? I think God sees that. And to him, it's worth it. You're worth it. He sees the end from the beginning. He sees through the blood of Jesus all our past mistakes cleansed. And he sees us ruling and reigning with him one day. I don't know about you, ladies and gentlemen, but I'm looking forward to being there. We experience it. And, and here we experience, we live natural lives sprinkled with the supernatural. But imagine when we're with God and it's, we just roll with the Lord and you just, you just do stuff. you Anyway, I'm, I'm, I break myself so up on day, so it's, it's in crazy. God has taken great care in every detail of your lives. Every detail of your lives, He's taken great care. Two questions I want to ask. Have you wondered where God was tijdens die moeilijkste tijdperk in your life? Maybe as you're watching and you're listening now, you're in that place right here, right now. Maybe you're asking yourself, God, where are you? This oak doesn't know what he's talking about, man. This God that he's talking about, where's that God in my life? I don't see God. It's just one big mess. It's one disaster after the next. The hits keep on coming. And I'm not talking about Vol FM or Radio Borslace or whatever. The hits keep on coming. It's one blow after the next. Where's this God? Have you wondered, where has God been in the most difficult, challenging times in your life? Hmm? The other question is, where has God been in the most sinful times of your life? The first time this became a revelation to me, i done something bad. I mean really bad. And I'm like, God, where were you? And I just sensed the presence of God say, right here. 
right here in the midst of my darkest sinful periods in my life. God was right there. You see, there's nothing I can do to shock God. Like Mark Druch and Jesus like, God, did, did you see what Moses just done? Holy Spirit, did you check? Did you see what he's gotten up to? You can't surprise him with the things you do. So where was God in the most difficult times of your life? And where was God in the most sinful periods of your life? These two verses are going to explain exactly where God is in those times. Psalm 56 and verse 8. It says, You keep track of all of my sorrows. You keep track of all of my sorrows. You've collected all my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. Why did the psalmist write this? Traditionalists teach that there was a tradition where people would collect the tears of mourners, that they'd cry. People were paid to mourn. You hire some people. If you were not such a good oak, they hire more people to cry that the people could think that you were okay. You laughed. This is all right. They hired people to cry at your funeral. They collected the tears in the jar, and the superstition is that They'd sprinkle the tears in your grave, and I don't know what it would do. So the psalmist writes, God has collected all your tears in his bottle. My brother, my sister, you want to know where God was in your most difficult times in your life? Right there, collecting every painful, hurtful tear in a jar with your name on it. You want to know where was God in the roughest times of your life when you... When you you're at the peak of your career of sin. You're peaking <laughs> in your sinful career. How many of you can relate to what I'm saying? Anybody out there? Hallelujah. Just checking if I'm speaking to the right audience here. Where was God in those times? You see, you know, Habakkuk 1.13 says, God says, uh, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look upon wickedness. That's why when Jesus became sin on the cross for us, he cried out, my God, my God, where are you? The moment in time, God turned his back because Jesus became sin. Where was God in our sin as he sees us through the blood of Jesus? Listen to these 18 verses. It's 18 verses, so bear with me and open up your spirit to what God is to say this morning. Psalm 139 from verse 1. O oh Lord, you've examined my heart to know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. Wow. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and you follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me and too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. How many times in Christian circles do we hear ourselves say, you know, that full us of God so far weg is from my af. I'm so far away from God. Well, the Bible teaches that we can't get away from His presence. If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride, there we go, ride, it's ride, hallelujah, not drive. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even the darkness, even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so, fearful, so, so wonderfully complex. Some translations say fearfully and wonderfully made. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion and as I was woven together in the dark womb. Scientists have observed the development of a human growing in the womb. 
And as the baby develops to a point where the skin is complete over its eyelids, somehow, inexplicably, from nowhere, it's like an invisible scalpel is taken and simply starts splitting the skin that you get two eyelids. Science has no answer and no explanation. That's why the Bible says, skillfully, secretly put together in your mother's womb. I want to tell you, I sense in the Spirit to say this. This is for somebody. Maybe you've been told you were an illegitimate child. I want to tell you that's a lie from the pit of hell. A mother and a father may have had an illegitimate biological contribution towards your existence, but to God, ma'am, sir, you're not illegitimate. You are worth it. When it comes to the birth of a child, God doesn't go, oops. Hello? Take encouragement from that. There's no such thing as an illegitimate human being in the eyes of God. So some out of nowhere, some miraculous something happens and the eyelids just splits and becomes eyelids. That's God. Verse 16, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. I trust that by God's grace, somehow that scripture answers your question. God? Where were you in my most difficult times of my life? God, where were you in the most sinful times of my life? Right there. Because to God, you are worth it. You're worth it. He sees his potential in you. Here's the challenging thing. Not only has God called us, but he also wants us. Sometimes, if you do not have your own mode of transport, you call an Uber or you call a taxi and it gets the job done, correct? But do you want that Uber or do you want that taxi? No. You've got to get on with your life. God not only calls us, He also wants us. How many of you believe that God has no needs? Well, that's not true. God needs you. God needs you. He doesn't need you to build His kingdom. He, he chooses to use us. But He needs you. He needs your fellowship. He, he, God enjoys your company. Hello? God enjoys your company. God needs you. That's why He made you. You're worth it. You're a possession to God worth having. Not only has he called you, he also wants you because you're worth it. Isaiah 43 and verse 1. Often in scripture, we see specific things spoken to specific people for specific reasons at a specific time. This is a time where the scripture is spoken over the people of Israel, but we're making it our own today. And it says this, Isaiah 43 and verse 1. Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Imagine this, God in a creative mood one day says, Esther, and he speaks your name, you're mine. And then somewhere down the line, you're born. God one day says, Martin, you're mine. Before your parents have even met each other, man, and maybe before your parents were even born, long before they were born, he says, Martin, you're mine. He has this beautiful idea called Berinda, the Maslata Ian Dach. A datum and a tate and a plaque. The world is going to be introduced to a barinda. He not only calls you, he wants you. Why? You're worth it. You're worth it. We just celebrated Resurrection Weekend where God selfishly laid down his life. Jesus gave up his life, shed his blood, because to him we are worth it. He says, I've called you my name, you're mine. I've ransomed you, you're mine. Jesus is willing to entrust the gospel message with us. He could have chosen angels who would work tirelessly and have doctrinal perfection. 
And yet, he gives his gospel message to people that differ to the point where they start different churches. Ons glo, jy moet het so doen, ons glo, jy moet het so doen, kom ons begin ons eie dinge, daarom het jy die geherformde, reformeerde, nieuwe, ou, nieuwe, nieuwe ding, the new, the, the, it's, I, I don't know. We have all of these, God takes the gospel message and he gives it to people. Wetende, let ons, it's not always going to work in synchronicity. It, die gear is going to gestak and it's just going to be, some places with like 16 different churches on 16 different corners and that, that's okay, that's fine. But I think one of the unanswered, un, yet unanswered prayers of Jesus is the prayer in the garden in John 17 where he says, Father, I pray that they may become one as you and I are one. I believe that is still to happen. Churches split because of doctrinal issues or whatever. You know? And God still chooses to give his message to us because we're worth it. He could like I said, folks, think about it. He could have given that message to angels or to, to something. He, could have, he, couldn't have, he could have let the words be written on the skies. When we wake up in the morning, we see his words somehow printed with clouds or something or, or chiseled in the sides of mountains. Or I don't know. He, could, he can get the waves of the seas to make patterns and describe the words. He could have gone, he could have gone just, I would say, he could have gone bosses. But this is God we're talking about. And yet he chooses to give the message of the gospel to people like you and me because we're worth it. Folks, that is incredibly encouraging for me that he gives this gospel message to us. We're worth it. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you, and be sure of this. Be sure of this. It's like Jesus is saying, but wait, there's more. <laughs> I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. What's that age? It's this age, this dispensation of the gospel. And then in John 20 and verse 21, and Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. He entrusts us with his message because we are worth it. What would make Jesus' unimaginable suffering on the cross worth it? I, I don't know why, it's just I think the way God wired me. For the longest time I've enjoyed pushing my body to its physical limits, just seeing how much I can or cannot take, to the point where it's so sore that, you know, and I do certain exercises and stuff, and um, what I've been doing for a while is planking. How many of you know what a plank is? Planking. The world record has just been set for planking, 8 hours, 15 minutes, 15 seconds. And the oak is in his 60s. There's hope for me, Hallelujah. Guinea's Book of World Records, here I come. So I started planking, and I started timing myself. It's like, <laughs> what a joke. <laughs> Can it plank for a par seconds? But that's how you start off, and then it goes longer. And uh, when I push myself in things like that, what's interesting is that when the pain becomes unbearable, I can stop at any moment. I can stop it. Often I discuss my things with Colette, because I can. She's my wifey. Hallelujah. And she says, she goes, hmm. Self-inflicted. It's self-inflicted. I know it's self-inflicted. But the seven of us are working on something. Come speak to me afterwards. I'll tell you about the seven of us. But what's interesting is that I can stop the pain and suffering whenever I want to. Guess what? Exactly the same applies to Jesus. He could have stopped the pain and the suffering whenever he wanted to. Just like this. He didn't even have to click his fingers. He could have just thought about it and ended the pain and suffering. What kept Jesus keeping on? What kept him going on? Imagine, imagine, sure, imagine creating the mouth that's going to spit in your face. Imagine creating the hand that's going to rip your beard out. Imagine creating the fist that's going to punch you in the face. 
That's this Jesus, folks. He could have ended that pain and suffering at any time on the cross. What kept him? Imagine you're hanging there, you, 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 you're bleeding out. You're bleeding out. The pain is unbearable. And you still have the time to look after your mom. You say to John, behold your mother, behold your son. Knowing that he's going to need somebody to look after mom. You're going through that and you still say, Father, forgive them. Forgive them, Lord. He could have stopped that pain at any time. What kept him keeping on? I want to tell you. And I'm starting to land this thing. Last scripture and then I'm done. Hebrews 12, verse 1 to 2. And therefore, since we're surrounded by so huge a crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. And here's the kicker. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. And now he's seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. What's the joy that was before Jesus? What was that joy? Ladies and gentlemen, the cherry on the top of this message this morning is that you're the joy, who for the joy that was set before him. There's a song many years ago, it says that when he was on the cross, we were on his mind. And when Jesus looked into the future, <coughs> excuse me, and he saw, what's, what's today's date, the 11th? He saw on the 11th of April, 2020, there'd be men and women of God in a building today and next door watching online that would have said, yes, Lord, I want to live for you. He saw that. He saw that there would be people leaning into him, leaning into his presence. He saw that there would be people like you willing to live for Jesus. That's what Jesus saw. He saw the time and the date and the place when you would say, yes, Lord, I give my heart to you. He saw the time, the date, the place when you said your first sinner's prayer, when you invited Christ into your life as your Lord and your Savior. That's the joy that Jesus saw before him. That's what kept him on the cross. And you know what? You know what else he sees? He sees you leaving this building today. And he sees you going to be the change you want to see. He sees you facing the onslaughts and the attacks of the devil in the week that lays ahead. And he sees you overcoming that by faith. He sees you overcoming that by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. He sees you overcoming that by positive confession. He sees you overcoming that by quoting scripture. He sees you overcoming that by praise and worship. He sees you pressing on regardless. He sees you believing when the world tells you don't believe. In. Don't believe. He sees you carrying on regardless of what the enemy throws at you. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the joy that was set before Jesus. And there on the cross, he made up his mind, you are worth it. You're worth it. You're worth it. You are worth it. That's what kept Jesus to the cross. As we leave this place today, and the accusations are going to come, Maybe you're sitting in a place of great condemnation here, now, in this moment in time. Where you've let people down so much, you feel that you're not worth anything. And maybe the facts are, you had seriously droog gemaakt, my broer, my sister, this dalk die feite, maar die waarheid is, Jesus, pra, Jesus het is, uh, uh, die prijs betaal vir jou sonde las. He's paid the price completely, because to him, you are worth it. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your grace and we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for the encouragement from your word, Lord, that somehow you see something in us that perhaps we haven't seen ourselves. Father, this might be sweeping people up emotionally or, or feeling emotions on the spirit of the moment, Lord. But I pray, Holy Spirit of God, would you take 
the life-changing power of your word and make it alive to each person that hears this message. And deep down in their hearts, would you convince them and show them and prove to them that they are worth it? Lord, I pray that you remove lies and accusations and condemnation from the devil that is heaped upon your people. Would you remove them of those burdens, Lord God, and give them the conviction that they're valuable and precious to you. And maybe you're sitting here and you're listening, you're watching online, and you think, Mosey, I don't even know Jesus like this. I'd be doing you a disservice if I do not give you an opportunity in these moments right here and now. And if you want this kind of relationship with Jesus and you don't have that relationship, but you want it, and God has started to show you how much you're worth it to Him, I want you to pray this with me in your heart. Say, God, I come to you in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, I am daring to believe. I'm I'm, I'm choosing faith this morning. I'm I'm choosing to believe that you're God's son, that you died. You're dead for three days. You were in the grave and you took the authority from the devil and your shed blood paid the price for my sins to cleanse me. And I believe that you rose again. And Lord, I respond to your invitation this morning where you say that if I confess my sins and acknowledge that I'm a sinner, and call on you, Lord Jesus, that I'll be saved. So in my heart I believe, and with my mouth I confess, and I say, Jesus Christ, you're God's Son. And I ask you to forgive me, and help me start a new life in your name. I ask you, Lord, come into my life. You are my Savior, and would you be Lord of my life? In Jesus' name, amen. And folks, if you've prayed that prayer, the scripture teaches that your spirit, God has made your spirit born again. And if you do not have a spiritual home, I encourage you to find a church somewhere that teaches the true word of God, a place where you can belong, a place where you can grow, and a place where you can walk a journey with people that will help you in your walk with Jesus. And if you have yeah, this morning and you've prayed that prayer for the first time, maybe please don't go home unless you speak to one of us. We'd love to pray with you and help you understand and explain what has happened if you've prayed that prayer. Maybe you've prayed that prayer several times before, but you prayed it again in all honesty. Well, God bless you as well. We want to thank you folks for making the time to listen this morning. May Almighty God bless you and keep you. May God make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God lift up His countenance over you and give you supernatural peace that surpasses all understanding. We love you dearly. Take care. Have a great week. Um, Just on an administrative note, I'm looking for a ministry partner to minister on the weekend of the 21st to the 23rd of May. We're doing a ministry trip with the tear cut group of, um, of riders to the uh, Maluti Mountains in Fariesburg. So if you see a way clear, uh, God willing, we plan to be back. We will, by the grace of God, be back in time for church at Sunday morning. But I need a ministry partner. So if that is you, just make sure that you get in touch with me privately and um, we will take it from there. Thank you for coming. God bless you. Have a great week.